often at funerals you'll hear that someone has gone to heaven to be with Jesus, apparently presuming that person has a soul which had separated from their body and was alive and conscious in heaven. Although that may be a comfort to hear, it contradicts the resurrection from the grave at the last day that Jesus spoke of. And this is the Father's will which has sent me, that of all which he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. So when do we meet Jesus? Not until after our resurrection and his return. The Apostle Paul explains, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So, what happens at death and afterwards? When our breathing stops, we die and our thoughts perish. Our consciousness stops. His breath goes forth, he returns to his earth. In that very day, his thoughts perish. We go to the earth, the grave, knowing nothing until we are resurrected. For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything, neither have they any more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. The dead are figuratively asleep, and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Before Jesus resurrected Lazarus, he spoke of Lazarus being asleep in death. These things said he, and after that he said unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go, that I may awake him out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Howbeit Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking rest in sleep. Then Jesus said unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Did Jesus say anything about Lazarus going to heaven? No. Martha, Lazarus' sister, knew her brother would be resurrected at the last day. Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Those who have died in Christ will be resurrected at the last day, at Jesus' return. They, along with those in Christ who are physically alive when he returns, will then rise to meet Jesus in the air. The Apostle Paul gave this description. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Paul wrote that the dead in Christ would be raised incorruptible, immortal, having eternal life. At the same time, those in Christ who are not asleep would also receive immortality. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So, when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Well, what about Jesus? Did Jesus go to heaven when he died? No. After his death, Jesus as he foretold, remained in his tomb for three days and three nights. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jesus did not ascend to the Father until after his resurrection. Outside his tomb he spoke to Mary. Jesus said unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren, and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father, and your Father, and to my God, and your God. Was Jesus really dead in his tomb? Yes, he said so later. I am he that lives, and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen.
and have the keys of hell and of death. Most Christians assume people like Abraham and David have gone to heaven. They'd be surprised to hear Jesus said no one other than himself had ascended to heaven. And no man has ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. Peter confirmed this, stating that even David, a man after God's own heart, was still in his tomb and had not ascended to heaven. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. For David is not ascended unto the heavens, but he says himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, until I make thy foes thy footstool. Okay, so what about Elijah? Did Jesus forget that Elijah was taken to heaven in a chariot? No, of course Jesus didn't forget. Heaven can actually refer to different places above the surface of the earth, depending on the context. In the air, in the clouds, among the stars, or up in the heaven where we like to think God lives. For example, Revelation 19 verse 17 mentions the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, referring to vultures in the sky. Elijah was apparently taken through the air or sky to somewhere else on earth. How do we know? Years after his chariot ride, Elijah sent the next king, Jehoram, a letter, warning there were consequences coming for his evil ways. And there came a writing to him from Elijah the prophet, saying, Thus says the Lord God of David thy father, Because thou hast not walked in the ways of Jehoshaphat thy father, nor in the ways of Asa king of Judah, this transporting from one place to another on earth is also recorded in the New Testament. For example, Philip was caught away to Azotus just after baptizing the eunuch. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. To properly understand the afterlife, we must understand the differences between body, soul, and spirit. So let's spend a few minutes on them. We have a spirit that leaves the physical body at death. That spirit is nothing more than the same physical breath of life God gave Adam to bring his physical body to life. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Note that Adam became a living soul or being. He was not given a soul. Huge difference. The word soul has different definitions, one from the Bible, another from pagan doctrine, as we'll see in a moment. First, let's review more verses about the Spirit. The Spirit of God is the air we breathe. All the while my breath is in me, and the Spirit of God is in my nostrils. Without that spirit, or breath of life, the body dies. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Spirit, in that verse, is from the Greek word pneuma, meaning air, or the movement of air. That Greek word has survived to this day. For example, today we have pneumatic, air-powered tools. When Stephen was martyred, he asked Jesus to receive back his spirit, his breath of life. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Spirit, in that verse, is from the same Greek word pneuma. The spirit of or from God is nothing more than the air we breathe, our physical breath. It is not unique to each of us as persons and has no sort of immortality. It's just gaseous matter, without which our bodies would die. In the Bible, soul simply refers to a person or to the self. When Adam received the breath of life from God, he became a living soul, a person. Here's another example of soul referring to persons. And we were, in all, in the ship, 200, 3 score, and 16 souls. 
the idea that we have a soul or a spiritual component which leaves the body at death and is immortal comes from the pagan doctrine of the immortal soul. Over the centuries, that doctrine has crept into corrupted mainstream churches and has become widely accepted and unquestioned. Here is the pagan philosopher Plato teaching we have an immortal soul that leaves the body at death. Do we believe that there is such a thing as death? And is this anything but the separation of soul and body? And being dead is the attainment of this separation, when the soul exists in herself and is parted from the body, and the body is parted from the soul. Beyond question, the soul is immortal and imperishable, and our souls will truly exist in another world. So, where did the idea that we will never really die, that we have some sort of immortal soul, come from? It came from Satan. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. Most preachers today, having bought into the immortal soul doctrine, go on to present salvation in terms of where you'll spend eternity. Salvation is not about where you'll spend eternity. That's a false paradigm. Truth is, you won't even have an eternity unless you receive from God the gift of eternal life. Otherwise, you'll perish in death. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's right. Unless we receive the gift of eternal life, we'll perish. In contrast, most preachers today talk in terms of where you'll spend eternity, denying that anyone would perish. The Bible, both Old and New Testaments, consistently teaches the unsaved will perish. They'll be destroyed and not be anymore. Here's a few verses from the Old Testament. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. Yes, you shall diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. When the wicked spring is the grass, and when all the workers of iniquity do flourish, it is that they shall be destroyed forever. As the whirlwind passes, so is the wicked no more. But the righteous is an everlasting foundation. And here are a few more verses from the New Testament. Except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Salvation is not about where you'll spend eternity. It's about whether you'll even have an eternity by receiving the eternal life as a gift from God. Otherwise, you will perish. Those are the alternatives given in John 3.16. So, how do the unsaved perish? Through death. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. After resurrection and judgment, the unsaved will die again. It's called the second death in the Bible. After that second death, there is no more life and no hope of resurrection. It will be the end of them. They will never again be, as we read earlier. That's what it means to perish. The Bible shows we'll remain asleep in death, knowing nothing until resurrected. And we've seen that the dead in Christ will be resurrected when Jesus comes for them at the last day. Then they will rise to meet him in the air. Unfortunately, incorrect translations of Luke 23 verse 43 have misled many to think they'll be in paradise with Jesus the day they die. Here's the King James Version. Early I say unto thee, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Obviously, that contradicts what we've seen elsewhere in the Bible, that we wait in the grave until our resurrection at the last day. The Bible appears to contradict itself. So what's the explanation? The problem is in Bible translations. There is a translation error in the King James Version of Luke 23, verse 43. There were no commas or similar punctuation in the original texts. All the commas were added by translators. In this case, the comma before today should have been after today, or else should have been left out entirely. Here are two translations with no comma directly before or after today. Amen, I say to thee today that with me thou shalt be in the Garden of Eden. Jesus replied, I promise you today you will be with me in paradise. 
And here are two translations with a comma after, not before today. And Jesus said unto him, Truly, I tell you today, you shall be with me in paradise. And Yahweh said to him, Truly, I say to you today, you shall be with me in paradise. With the correct translation, everything makes sense. Jesus was in his tomb, dead, for three days and three nights. He was not in paradise the same day he died. Jesus did not ascend to the Father until after his resurrection. We will remain in our graves until resurrection. The dead in Christ will rise to meet him in the air at the last day, at his coming. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. So, what happens after the dead in Christ rise to meet him in the air? Do they go to heaven or paradise forever? No. Those in that first resurrection, at Jesus' return, will return to earth with him. They will rule with him right here on the earth for the next 1,000 years. And he shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. There will be a much larger resurrection of all the rest of the dead after the thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. Jesus described this later resurrection. Marvel not at this. For the hour is coming, in which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice, and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. After the final judgment, only those having eternal life will remain. They will inherit a new, recreated earth, as described in Revelation 21, verses 1 through 4. That's the paradise Jesus spoke to the thief about. Earlier, we saw that upon death, our thoughts perish. We have no consciousness, and we know nothing. Upon resurrection, of course, our consciousness returns. To those resurrected at Jesus' return, it will seem like no time had passed since the last conscious moment at death. Paul understood that after departing in death, the very next thing he would know would be that he had been resurrected and was meeting Christ. That seemingly immediate meeting with Christ was what Paul was referring to when he wrote, For I am at a strait between two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Paul was confident and even willing to die, knowing that as soon as he died, the next thing he would know would be this, that he had been resurrected and was rising to meet Christ. We are confident, I say, and willing, rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Paul was not a hypocrite, believing he would go to meet Jesus at the moment of his death, while telling the Thessalonians that they would have to wait for their resurrection at Jesus' return before they could rise to meet Jesus. No, Paul wrote that he hoped to attain the very same resurrection he told the Thessalonians about, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Where do we go when we die? We go to the grave, and there we'll stay, asleep in death, until we receive the promised resurrection. Perhaps you're wondering, well, where does hell fit into all this? Didn't Jesus warn of hell many times in the Bible? Well, that depends on which version of the Bible you read. Here's a few versions that never use the word hell. Young's Little World Translation, the World English Bible, the New American Bible, Revised Edition, and the New Catholic Bible. So, how did hell get into most Bibles? Church translators, thinking we have immortal souls, had also adopted hell from pagan religion to explain where the unsaved lived forever. They wrote hell into the Bible, literally 
putting hell into Jesus' mouth by mistranslating three Greek words. Here's an example. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye, and having two eyes, to be cast into hellfire. Hell, in that verse, is from the Greek word Gehenna, or Gehenna, the dump outside Jerusalem. The trash and garbage thrown there was sure to be destroyed by the constant fire, hellfire, and worms, or maggots, in the dump. Jesus was saying that just as trash thrown into that dump was sure to be destroyed, the wicked would surely be destroyed. They would perish and never again be, as we saw earlier. Here is another example of Gehenna being translated as hell. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Again, Gehenna pictures destruction. Body and person will be destroyed. The lake of fire in the Bible, like the Gehenna dump, pictures destruction. Revelation 21 verse 8 defines going into the lake of fire as the second death. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and homongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. In the King James Version, Hell appears 23 times in the New Testament, 12 times translated from that Greek word Gehenna, another 10 times translated from the Greek word Hades, referring to the grave, the resting place of the dead, and one time translated from the Greek word Tartaraos, referring to confinement of fallen angels in 2 Peter 2 verse 4. So, what is the everlasting punishment Jesus spoke of? and these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. The everlasting punishment is the second death. It is everlasting in this respect. It is finished, permanent, and irrevocable, like the execution of a criminal. It is not perpetual, ongoing punishing. But, of course, if you've been schooled to think you have an immortal soul that will suffer eternal, ongoing, active punishing, you would interpret everlasting punishment to mean everlasting punishing. Eternal torment in hell is not only incorrect, it paints God, the God of mercy, as a sadistic monster who would subject the unsaved to endless, hopeless suffering. Does the hell idea do any harm? Yes. Millions of reasonable people dismiss Christianity as nonsense when they hear that a merciful God would send a person into perpetual, pointless suffering.